Hi everybody. How are you? Thank you for coming to my presentation. I'm Dr. Franklin and uh, I teach humanities and music here at Mountain View. Um, before we start, I want to, and this is really for the benefit of those of you in the room who are students, um, I took this trip with a colleague and a friend, a buddy, um, who used to teach here, she's now at Eastfield, um, history professor Liz Nichols. So I teach humanities, she teaches history. Here's what I would like for, for to make sure that everybody knows. The discipline, sometimes we don't do a good enough job of making sure that you guys understand that when you go from class to class to class, that there's a connection. And I remember being an undergraduate and there were some classes that was like, why do I need this class? Why is this on my degree plan? I don't know what this is. I don't, I don't. Every class that we have to take, we only take it for one reason. And that is to better understand what it is to be human. That's the only reason. We don't need biology unless we want to better understand what it is to be a living being. We don't need any of those courses. So it's like, uh, it's like there's a house and we're all holding hands and we're encircling the house. And each one of us represents a different academic discipline. Are you with me? And there are windows and doors open so we all have a view in t inside the house. And that house is humanness. Those of us that can see through the front of the house into the living room, we have a different view of that house than the people that are standing in the backyard, right? But for us to know the house, if we were going to buy the house, we're not going to buy it based upon the view from the front yard. We're going to buy it based upon the circular, the 360 view. And so this is how your degree programs were envisioned. This is how all of the disciplines hang together. So Professor, for my buddy Liz, uh, is more narrowly focused into American history. But I'm humanities, and the root of humanities, the root of that word is the word human. So we're looking at the historical, obviously, but we're also looking at and, and thinking about the impact on us as people having to live within a society, having to navigate what are really kind of sometimes crazy, sometimes bizarre, sometimes desperate, sometimes we don't even know the word to, to use to describe it, waters. So does that make sense in terms of how to synthesize the information that we're going to be looking at today? Yeah, okay. Stephanie is going to assist me. I'm not accustomed to having an assistant and already I like it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so can we advance the slide, please? Oh, I'm glad I have my computer. Girl, I can't read that. Okay. Um, why were we going to Alabama? We were going to Alabama for intellectual enrichment because we're nerds, we're professors. And I mean, this is true. We were going for that. But that was the secondary reason. The primary reason was we wanted to visit the museum that everyone calls the Lynching Museum, but the name of the museum is the um, National um, Memorial for Peace and justice. And this is all under the umbrella organization of EJI, which was started by Brian Stevenson. Can you advance? Yeah. I think I'll just look at you and then it'll look like we actually rehearsed this. So our first step, because we thought, you know, we, we know a lot. We weren't ignorant going into this. But then we realized neither of us had taken this excursion that's part of the civil rights pilgrimage. Now, just so you know, SMU has for years been taking students on a civil rights pilgrimage that I hear is absolutely fabulous. But that civil rights pilgrimage, you can do it in pieces or you can do the whole thing. If you're going to start here, you would have to include Birmingham, Alabama, go all the way through Montgomery, go to Selma, you, to stop and go through Georgia, all the way up through the rest of the slave states into Tennessee. So that would take a long time. We we didn't do that leg. We did Montgomery to Selma. Okay? We didn't do Birmingham because we had already been to Birmingham. So that was our reasoning and I wanted to put that on a map for you so that you would have some idea of uh, the, the close proximity. And if I, were, if I were still living in New York, I wouldn't have to do that. But I'm in Texas and I'm a Texas girl. And so I need you to know that 
those states are really close together. <laughs> and so we would still be in Texas trying to do that, but that's actually uh, crossing. And then we also went to Columbus, Georgia. And so that, uh, we hired a docent. The word I'm using is D as in David, O-C-E-N-T. A docent is a person who is very knowledgeable about a subject who will accompany you and um, enhance your experience in a museum setting by giving you background information and also supplementing uh, what you already know with the things that maybe you did not know. The reason we did this for her was we said she lives there. She's going to know stories that we're not possibly going to have. She's going to have stories that you had to live there to know. Because as we know, and I know we have history students here, there's something called oral histories, right? And those are valuable. And so unless you're talking with someone that has that oral history, you're not going to be able to read in a book and find that out. So off we went. This was the itinerary. Our focus for this presentation is going to be on the National Memorial, which is in red, but I wanted you to know, so that you would also know what was there, but just between Montgomery and Selma, there's the Rosa Parks Museum, uh, the Lowndes County Interpretive Center, the Edmund Pettus Bridge. That is the one that, for those of you who's taken your History 1302, would be, yeah, 1302 already, you would know was Bloody Sunday. I think it's still, Mark, you're still referring to it that way. Um, and Congressman, uh, existing Congressman, Congressperson John E. Lewis, who's in the House of Representatives. That's where all that happened. Uh, Viola Luz, uh, Luzio Memorial, the Freedom Riders Museum. Have they, uh, they studied about the Freedom Riders too, is that correct, in 1302? I've, I'm looking to my historians in the room. Confirm, because I don't want to make a mistake. You got historians in the room. You have to, you have to be careful. Um, Dexter Avenue King Memorial Baptist Church, the Dexter Parsonage and Museum. This would be the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, part of the pilgrimage and the places that he preached and also lived and worked. Um, the Civil Rights Memorial Center, the Brown Chapel AME Church, again Dr. King, National Voting Rights Museum, the Southern Poverty Law Center. If you're not familiar with the Southern Poverty Law Center, um, that's one that you should look into, kind of jot that down. Go to their website and if for nothing else, and I'm telling you this, this is sort of like off to the side of what we're doing today, they have what's called a hate map. It's interactive. And you can go, and it, it, it stays, it's, it's in real time. They monitor and track, among other things, they monitor and track the advent, descent, and the um, um, status of hate groups in this country. And you can look state by state, county by county. Go online the next time you think about it and pull up that hate map, and you might be you might be a little surprised by what you see, and not in a good way, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> and then the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in the Legacy Museum. <gasps> so that was how we spent um, a 10 days <laughs> in, in July in Alabama. So the Rosa Parks Museum, where I'm standing, is actually on the concrete and the man cover where she actually stood when she was waiting to board the bus. And as, as another little addendum, Rosa Parks was not the first person to refuse to give up her seat on a bus. And I know that we don't necessarily get that when we're in high school. I know the college um, history classes kind of clean that up a little bit. There, there's a name, Claudette Colvin who was a, a teenage girl that, um, that had done this earlier. And so she's included in the information when you visit those, uh, those museums. Next slide, please. This is the Edmund Pettus Bridge. You might recognize that just from pictures or from seeing it on television. And it crosses the Alabama River, which is a good sized river. There's a lot of dark history associated with that river as well. Next. And this is the King Memorial Baptist Church. Next. 
slide please okay and so we get to the National Memorial for Peace and Justice yes this piece I think is like two minutes or two minutes and 12 seconds um, so let's look at that I know the links worked earlier I love the Lord. he heard my cry I slide please um, memorials and this is just really interesting it's in particular for this one because this has historical purpose for being there but it's also a museum and so when we think of museums we think of art okay now within museums, even art museums, and uh, former students of mine that are here know because they have to go to the museum, that it's not just paintings and sculptures and drawings, there are also artifacts and mummies and all of these other things because it's part of our culture. But to mix those two, how do you bring, though, that's where the discipline's coming together, how, how do you make that work? A space for viewing, which is by definition what the word gallery means. How do you handle that with such a delicate subject where you do not want to appear to be voyeuristic or looking um, with as if you were watching people that had been corralled or had been caged because the slaves were caged like animals in a zoo. And so how do you create a space for that? You need to come up with some common goals. You need to decide what's really important because you can't accomplish everything in one space. And so they established some criteria and this quote, I didn't want to try to paraphrase it because it's just so important the way they've structured it. This is a America's first memorial dedicated to the legacy of enslaved black people. People terrorized by lynching, African Americans humiliated by racial segregation and Jim Crow, and people of color burdened with contemporary presumptions of guilt and police violence. Okay. 
So this is the purpose for this particular collection. And it opened last April, by the way. Yes. So their goals were to investigate the thousands of racial terror lynchings in the South and to understand the terror and trauma this sanctioned violence against the black community created. The word terror is here for a reason and that's because it was terror. We act as though domestic terrorism only appeared in the 21st century and that's just not true. Okay. People's, the, the compromised and the marginalized people within this country have been living with terror since the very beginning. And our focus is on the African American experience and you will see through this that as a result of having living with those lynchings that life itself, what became normal, is not what the average person would consider to be normal. For example, fathers going to bed with shotguns or sitting up with shotguns to guard the house or people sleeping with shotguns under the pillow. That, in most homes today, with it, well, that's not normal. It is in black homes, even until this very day. Okay. So terror changes a community. It changes a culture. It changes a society. The next slide, please. But there has to be a process. We know that there were many more thousand lynchings than what we can document because some of the lynchings were hidden, others were not. So how do you document that? Because you have a responsibility to history, right? Where are my people that have studied American history at the college level? Do I have history students here? Where are you? Okay, don't, don't hide. I know your professor's here in the back. I know you're here. I bring this up because of what? Primary and secondary sources, right? and citations on the papers that you write. Well, here we are. Can we just say, because our Mima told us that great Uncle John had been lynched and we believe it and we wouldn't question that, can we go to EJI and say, my uncle did this and his sister's cousin's next door neighbor's boyfriend's uncle was there and saw the whole thing? You can't do that. All right, well, then how are we gonna document that? Especially if it was the result of the night Riders, who are the KKK running around in the middle of the night in dresses that were doing these things, how are we going to document this? There had to be a way. So it means that all the many thousands of lynchings, we're not able to document the, the bulk of them. So this museum has a living task. It's like a living project that once they can corroborate, once they can satisfy the scholastic rigor that research demands in the humanities and in history and in government and in every other course you take, then and only then will they go through and put this in their museum because otherwise their museum has no credibility, right? And they didn't go through all of this to not have credibility, okay? But it's a problem. So they have to document and then they have to verify. They visited hundreds of lynching sites. They collected soil samples, and that's a really poignant part of the museum. There's an area where there's a plexiglass case. It's about the size of a coffin, and it contains the soil from all of the places that they documented where lynchings had occurred. And so when I first saw that, I, it, I felt the way uh, those of us who feel a strong connection to the Vietnam Memorial feel, that in an abstract sense the Vietnam Memorial is like, eh, unless of course you lived during that period and you lost someone in the Vietnam, in the, in the Vietnam War and then that wall is what you have and your reflection in that wall. It becomes personal for people who have no place to mourn. Where do you go to mourn? Where do you go? When the body was burned and mutilated and castrated and all the little pieces were scattered and sold off as souvenirs, because yes, that's what happened. Where's the graveyard? Where's the headstone? Where do you put it? It doesn't exist. So where do you go? And if you're a relative, what do you do with all that emotion? Okay? We're human. We have emotion. Where, where do we, how do we process that? Um, and erecting public markers. Now those columns that you saw in the video, those, uh, the museum has, has created one for each county 
for whom they have documented the lynchings. So the museum has them hanging, okay? That connection should be obvious. But they have another set, a duplicate set, that they're giving to the counties. They say, you don't have to pay for them. It is, come and get it. So Dallas County has a column. Professor Nichols and I got in touch with the Office of Cultural Affairs with the city of Dallas here. We coordinated with uh, my new Southern Studies history professor that I had when I was working on my doctorate, Dr. Natalie Ring, because she, her work is in that area right now. She's focused on Angola prison, but I knew she would play because she just loves that. And we were getting together because we wanted to build a combo course where our community college students would have a similar assignment with UT Dallas graduate class, undergraduate and graduate, sounds like it won't work, it's beautiful, our idea, but also we wanted to coordinate on trying to lobby to make sure that that ball isn't dropped, to make sure that that column winds up in Dallas where it belongs. And of course, I talked to Dr. Davis, who is here, who's our uh, president at Mountain View, and I said, we need that column in Mountain View. It would be perfect over on the west side, you know where it hangs down right there. We need that column. Liz and I, we need, we've got a spot for it. It's gonna work in the art department. Allison will take good care of it. We've gotta have that column, gotta have that column. Well, UTD was going, oh no, mm -mm. we got a brand new building. We can have this column here. Then John Spriggins is going, excuse you, I am the director of the South Dallas Cultural Center. I do believe that column would fit. And then I'm the curator of the African American Museum. And I'm like, oh, hush. But working together with a combined effort of just trying to get it to the city, okay? As just a simple thing. Um, go to the next slide, please. The columns are made of cord and steel. That's what it looks like. So if you're standing underneath it, you can see Dallas County, Texas. And then on the front, the one that's laying flat, you will see the names. Thousands of lynchings in Dallas County. They could document two that wound up going on the column, okay? Because it doesn't take one source. Museum wants three. They want three. And the three have to pass the rigor test, okay? So it's, it's we understand it, but at the same time, it's like, ugh, ugh. Um, next slide, please. Okay, in the, the video that we watched, you saw something about Jim Crow. I, I know not to assume that everybody is going to know uh, what's meant by that. Um, Jim Crow refers to a time in our history that, uh, and I'm going to pull this up just for a second. Randy, don't get mad at me. People streaming, they made me hide my computer because it's hiding my face, but that's too small for me to read. Um, and I don't want to guess at the dates again. Okay. A couple of things so time won't be abstract for you. Slavery ended in 1865, we know that. Then we have a period of reconstruction, we know that. But a lot of times people will want to say, well, but blacks were free at the end of slavery, okay? Emancipation, you know, all of that. It's like, no, 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 no. Because if you're not, if you don't have equality in the system and if you can't vote, you're not free. How are you free? That's like somebody says, okay, we'll let you out of your jail cell, but you can't leave loose there. Well, um, I'm going to stay in the building. You just may as well leave me in my cell because I'm still not free. Um, and so you have 1865. Who knows when the Civil Rights Act was signed into law? Anybody? Huh? Mm -hmm. How many years is that from the end of slavery? Yeah, that's a long time. I was 14. To make that real, because you're looking at me, I see her eyes got big like, whoa, that wasn't that long ago. And it's like, no, it wasn't that long ago. I was 14 when that happened, okay? So freedom, we just had a little, <gasps> a little whiff of it. So what was going on in the interim? 
there was a period of time where in the South um, there, there was segregation, enforced segre segregation laws. And so there were things that you couldn't eat a, a drink from the same water fountain. And this is the world I was born into as a child. You couldn't go through the front door. You couldn't um, use the same restrooms. You couldn't, you couldn't go to school with white children in the South. Now my friends my age who grew up in the North, they went to school with white children. But in the slave states, oh no, we're not going to have anything like that. That's not going on. And so you just, just really, it was very repressive. And something, and so this is a picture, a very famous um, Irwitt uh, photo of the different water fountains. And you can see that not only are they separate water fountains, but the quality and the design of the water fountains is very different. It was during this period that the lynchings really increased and just were like on steroids. So we have the greatest number and we have most of our terroristic activities. Now, I should also point out to you that lynchings aren't over. That, it's not like that doesn't still happen, okay, just to be clear. And the last documented case was in the 1980s, okay, though we know there are newspaper accounts in the 1990s. I think you need to know that. So we're only focusing on a, a, um, a robust period of time. Next, please. There are hangings and then there are lynchings. And in lynchings you have hidden lynchings and you have spectacle lynchings. Hanging is legal definition. It has nothing to do with lynchings. And a lynching should not be called a hanging. A lynching is an illegal practice. There are states, and there were more states at one time, that had hanging as the um, the, the, the punishment that was meted out for a certain crime. So if you got the death sentence, like we have lethal injection in Texas, some have been, you know, what, and some states had hanging, okay? So the, these uh, terms cannot be used interchangeably. One has to do with criminal justice system, the other is in it in and of itself an illegal act, and that would be lynchings. Does that make sense? Okay, next slide, please. Um, this is located in Center, Texas, which is in East Texas. I've given you a list of the states where you had the heaviest concentration of lynchings. Now, this doesn't mean that the only place lynchings happened were in the South. They happened all over the country. Can you click on the interactive map, please? Yes, every place is red. And see, it's all the way up. And even, oh, and, but this is the heaviest concentration. So if you visit the EJI site, then you can go, and it's, it's, really, um, it, it's really something to go in and then highlight and find a state of your interest and see, and you have the legend there um, by color in terms of the density and the numbers. In the state of Arkansas, in one year, there were 237 lynchings in one day. 237. 237. Okay. Let's continue. Next slide. Um, what is the next slide? Okay, yeah, go, go back. Thank you. What is this? This is the back of a postcard. lynchings were planned. Some lynchings were like organic, out of the moment, we, we, get, we, we were mad and, and, and we just mob violence and you go and you do this terrible thing. And I think that for most people that's what they think all lynchings were. It was like, oh just people just lost their minds for a minute and got out of control. Well there were some that that was the way it was. But that wasn't the majority. In the majority of cases, they were planned. And so what do I mean by planned like what? Like you plan a family reunion. Like you plan a party. And that's where the postcards come in. Okay. In some instances, the postcards were sent out in advance of the event. In most instances, a photograph was taken, because we, we, photography became um, viable as a business in the United States around 1835. 
Okay, now we had photography before then, but in terms of being able to really go into it as a profession, 1835. So we've got photography of Mexican American War. I mean, we've a lot of pictures. So you hire a photographer come in, take the photo. You could get uh, these little postcards that were very popular at one time because they were very, very inexpensive if people weren't writing a letter. They just put it on the card, the pictures on one side, little notes on the other, boom, you put them in the mail, you're done. And so that's what you're looking at here. This is just a note. Um, he killed Earl's grandma. She was Florence's mother. Um, give this to Bud from Aunt Myrtle. And you drop that in the mail, okay? Move forward, please. Uh, the limb on that tree that you just saw in Center, Texas, the limb that um, the, the first individual was hung from, they hung someone else from that same limb. The limb died. After um, the second hanging, move to the next slide, please. Then the limb was um, um, cut down and used to make gavels. So you have illegal activities and the hanging limb from the hanging tree for the illegal lynchings goes into the U.S. criminal justice system and is used by judges in courts. And have all those gavels been destroyed? Heck no. No. They're still in use. Okay. Because gavels aren't that big. Meanwhile, oak trees are. That was a lot of wood. Okay. The, this uh, presentation was shotguns, sheep, and sheets. Um, the sheep are those that follow others into action without using their critical thinking skills. And it, it takes no courage to hide yourself and go forth and do any kind of actions. I come from a family of service. I have my, um, my nephew's son and uh, his cousin are, are currently in service, uh, both of them making a career of it. My father was in World War II. I mean, I come from a family of service, and I feel a special some kind of way about, about vets. That's courage. They don't go into battle covered. They don't wear sheets. They don't wear costumes, you know. When they come home, they're wide open, targets. This, eh. um, sheep need a shepherd. So there's got to be a leader. And in those hate groups, in those supremacist groups, and the, and the most successful one, not the only one, but the most successful one was the Ku Klux Klan at the time. That was the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. And so getting people to follow you, uh, there will always be people that will follow because there will always be people that are kind of easily manipulated. That's how these things happen. Yes. Um, there's a group, and, and because the images that you're going to see from the lynchings are about those that are in Texas, more specifically Dallas. I will never forget, and don't ask me names, I won't tell, but I'm, I will never forget this. Having uh, finished teaching a minority studies class, and one of my students came, to, uh, waited afterwards, and talked to me in the hall. And her eyes were tearing up, and she was, she, I think she was in her 30s at the time. She was a mature woman, and she and she said, "You encouraged us to talk with our history professors if we wanted more information about blah blah blah." And I went, "Yeah, I always do that. I'm not a historian." And she said, "I did that, and I went to my professor, and he told me that there were no lynchings in Texas." And I said, are you sure that's what you said? That can, I, and she said, yeah. She said, he told me he was not aware that there were any lynchings in Texas. And my response was, you have seen the evidence. And I walked away and I went somewhere and said things that were totally inappropriate. But, um, but yeah, so I don't assume that people know things anymore, okay, no matter whether they should or not. Um, next slide, please. Uh, planned in advance, advertised in newspapers. Yes, spectacle lynchings. Mm -hmm. They ran ads. Uh, they would advertise through telegraphs, uh, sent invitations, and extreme violence had to be there because of the lynching. And you might say, well, what's extreme? They were already lynched. That wasn't enough. 
pouring coal oil over someone and setting them on fire and then lynching them and then cutting them into pieces and then taking their internal organs out and selling them the ones that you did not want to keep as souvenirs and then in some instances going even further I mean it was you said well that's overkill yeah but that was part of the spectacle lynching and what I'm telling you is a majority of them were that next slide America's first spectacle lynching was in Texas in Paris Texas this information is not hard to find I don't know the, the population of Paris, Texas today. If somebody, because we've all got our devices, if somebody can run out on the internet, um, it, I, don't, I don't know how the Wi-Fi is here, and let me know what the population of Paris, Texas was in 1893. But 10,000 people? I can't imagine that they had 10,000 citizens. <laughs> Paris is, is a little, it's a cute little town, but mm, okay. So Henry Smith was 17. He was mentally challenged, which means that today the courts would have protected him from capital punishment anyway because of that. It didn't matter then. Um, and so these are, the, these are the scenes here, two photographs from that, that spectacle. Next slide, please. And as soon as you find that figure, that, uh, can you, that um, number, if you can tell me, that would be great. The, what? No, 1893, if you can find it, or close, as close as you can get to that. The entire county came to the spectacle. The, the, the DA, if anybody's curious, is like, why in so many communities of color is there so much distrust with law enforcement? Well, this has a little something to do with it. Okay, there's a history. The DA, the district attorney, delivered the boy to the mob. So once again, if you can't go to the people that are there to protect you, if you can't dial 911, except to learn that 911, well, they're the ones that set your house on fire, then where do you go? He was put on the floor. Um, drawn by white horses through the principal streets of the city. Uh, just Let's move to the next one. This is a scaffolding that was built for him. And that's a close-up of him. The photograph that most people see, and I think these are at SMU, by the way. SMU has a collection of the lynching photos. Dallas Public Library downtown branch has a collection. And so does the Library of Congress. And if you're not familiar with what the Library of Congress is, it's the nation's library. And they have an online uh, digital photograph uh, section. But yes, so the, the photograph that's down at the bottom is of people that were gathering at the train depot waiting for waiting for the body to come, for him to arrive. And then that's him. That's a close-up of that picture that's far away. 3,900. 3,900 people. So there are 10,000 that came. Population was 3,900. And, and we know why, because the whole county came. Okay. Um, slide, please. This is Lee Daniels. That's, that's him. And this photo, um, the one next to it is of him actually um, being hung, the, the young man in Center, Texas. But I wanted that close up for one reason. I wanted you to see that these, these people didn't have any problem, they didn't feel ashamed. We're looking at their faces. They're not hiding. So what does that mean? Do not forget that for a long period of time, the lives of black people were not valued equally. Remember that at one point we were considered only three-fifths of a person? Remember at one point that we were savages? If you don't value another living being as being even with you, if you have convinced yourself that this person is not fully human, then that means you consider them as the other. That's what's meant by that term, the other. You're different. You're not like us. Then you can rationalize anything. You're not hanging a human being. You're hanging a savage. You're hanging something but you're not hanging somebody like you because you are fully human. 
Okay. What does it mean to be human? And a lot of these people showed up with Bibles in one hand. They had convinced themselves that they were doing God's work. Okay. Next slide, please. This is Waco, Texas. This is probably the best known. Um, 1916, you can see the fire in the center. This is Jesse Washington. Next slide, please. That's a close-up. And the, the, um, the one by the tree, um, <laughs> as if this wasn't enough, they decapitated him. So that's his head. Okay. It's down by the root of the tree. And those are the embers. That's what was left. Next slide, please. Oh, Dallas. Big T. Holland Allen Brooks. Um, and a word, if you're interested in this or even when you come across things in research, you're not going to find the name Holland easily. Liz and I were actually confused. So I love it when we, when we make discoveries and the learning process just never fails to, it never disappoints. Um, because I thought, I texted her and I went, who did you, I didn't pay attention to the name on the column. It said a Holland, who's Holland? I'm not finding a Holland. And I mean, I'm researching and I'm good at it. I'm going, I'm not finding a Holland. And she's like, oh, Holland, it was Alan. I went, I know, everything is saying Alan. All the history books, everything is saying Alan. And so then I texted my professor, Dr. Ring, and I said, are they the same person? Did he have two names? She said, yes, he was Holland Allen Brooks. I went, you know what? Give somebody like a, I don't know, send out a, a blast. Put it on something. Boom. Give us a clue. So I'm, that's why I'm telling you this. Finding it under Holland, I found really hard to do. And when that column comes to Dallas, remember this conversation, because it doesn't have the name Allen on it. It says Holland Brooks. So when they put a name in quotes, we're from the South. You know what that means? That's what we call them. It's like Beatrice Big Mama Jones. Big Mama was not on her birth certificate. That's just what everybody called her. Okay. But that, that can drive you crazy when you're conducting research, can it? It's just like, oh, I've got a paper too. Um, this is one of the sources that's trusted, newspaper. Um, slide, please. This is at Maine and Ackerd in downtown Dallas. This particular photograph is one that if you Google this and Alan Brooks lynching, this is what's going to pop up. The photograph is on one side of the postcard. The message, the writing is on the other side of the postcard. And I can't remember if this is the one or not that refers to it as a barbecue. Like, wish you were here. This is a nigger we barbecued like last Thursday. It was great. You know, there were this many people that came. Can you move to the next one, please? And this, there was an archway there. See that arch? I've got a clean shot and then the shot with the people. So the clean shot is like uh, pre, the, the shot that's hard to see, that's after the lynching, and these are the people that are still there. Okay, Maine and Ackert. And uh, this is a library at SMU. Can we, and this is Maine and Ackert today. So when you're ever down in that area, know that that is a place. Now he was, he was in jail in the Red Hook Courthouse and was dragged to Maine and Ackert. And I don't know how well you know downtown, but that's not very far if you're on a bike. But if somebody's dragging you, hmm, it's not close. I put this in here just so that you would know that the Dallas News wrote that up. Don't try to read it. I didn't intend for you to do that. But I wanted you to know that there was a newspaper article about this. And so that's the significance that it had. Yes. Did, we didn't listen to the three witnesses at the beginning, did we? Can we go back? Um, 
what, the people that you're about to listen to, one of them escaped the lynching, and the other people actually saw the lynching. Yeah, the crowd was beginning to gather as soon as we were put in jail. And by morning, uh, they were cluttering up the jail yard. And all that day, they kept coming. And by, by nightfall, there was 10 to 15,000 whites out there screaming for the blood of us three blacks. Very tense feeling among everybody. And uh, you felt it all over town. The sheriff had told the police not to shoot out there. There were women and children. And four big white men got some sledgehammers in their hands and they started knocking on the cement blocks and the stone around the steel door that was the entrance to the jail. And they come dragging one of the boys down out of the jail. They took him right down the sidewalk. Everybody was kicking, hitting him and everything else. And there was a Model T Ford Coupe that a woman was standing up there and just, they was all going crazy. And uh, she jumped down. She had high heels. I seen this happen. And her high heels just scraped, scraped a hole just like cut with a knife down his back. They pulled him out and they drug him up there by a car. And they took him off of there and put him on, hung him up on the uh, maple tree. And he reached up to get hold of the rope to keep from choking him. So they let him down and broke his arms so he couldn't hang on to the rope. They pulled him up again as we went by. Uh, some of you, a few of you, are old enough to have remembered an actor by the name of Henry Fonda. The, 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 the ones of you that are young, don't try. You, you know. <laughs> He's been dead longer than you've been alive, but, but there are people that are with me in, in age that will know Henry Fonda. Uh, he actually witnessed that lynching because his parents' uh, business was across the street. He was 14. And that influenced him um, when he got into his career. He was in a movie called Oxbow. And that was as a result of, ha he wanted to have that part in that film because of having seen this. Okay. Mrs. Moore has fond memories of her youth, but that was not always the reality for Negroes in Omaha or the nation as a whole. The end of World War I brought on a lot of change. The enlisted men were returning home. Government spending on arms was winding down. Competition for work became fierce. For the first time, whites had to compete with blacks for jobs. Whites turned their anger and frustration on black neighborhoods, spreading terror and fear nationwide. Many were killed. The year was 1919, and it was the bloodiest summer ever between the races. Omaha was not spared its measure of violence. That September, a white woman, Agnes Lobeck, accused a black packing house worker, Will Brown, of rape. He was arrested, held and questioned by police in the Douglas County Jail. Out on the street, a mob of angry men demanded Brown be handed over to them. The police refused. The mob then set fire to the jail. As officers battled the flames, the mob stormed in and drug Brown out to the street below. By now, the mob had grown to several thousand. Omaha Mayor Ed Smith tried to stop them, but the vigilantes turned their rage on him. The mayor narrowly escaped being lynched and was cut down in time to save his life. Brown was not so lucky. He was shot hundreds of times. Then his body was hung from a light pole. The body was dragged through the streets of downtown Omaha. 
Finally, it was torched and burned. By morning, the city was placed under martial law. Troops were posted along the streets to prevent further outbreaks of violence. The riot was confined to the courthouse and parts of downtown. However, its impact extended deep into the black community. And I remember the humiliation. I remember that I was ashamed. I can remember the fear among the people of the North, and it was a fear for all of us. There wasn't too many of the black children in the high school at that time, so for a couple of days, most of us stayed away. We were very ashamed, very ashamed. Why were you ashamed? Well, I, you know, when you're 14, uh, when things like that kind of shock you, and uh, you can't believe this, that they can do anything. And then it kind of strikes you for maybe the first time that um, because your color, that that kind of does something to you. That, that kind of does something to you. Uh, it always did, and it, it always has, and still does. This is from one of the museums, but I wanted to show you. Uh, from, from the far, the first one, you just see a bed there. But I did a close-up here because I wanted you to see the butt of the shotgun that's under the mattress. This was a tent city that was in use during um, one of the marches. And there were various stations along the way where people would open up uh, sometimes their homes or they would have a facility where the marchers could rest could just rest and get water or maybe use the facility. And so this, that's what the tent city was for, but a lot of black homes. This is the way people protected their homes. Um, and it, it was common, I talked about that earlier as being part of the normal, okay? Now the last slide that I want to use, if we could put that up please. Did you know that? As we sit here today, lynching is not a federal crime. The guy that we had in the museum told us that the number one question he is asked by international visitors is, where else can we go in the United States? We're here from Japan or we're from Switzerland. We would like to visit more slave, the mu museums dedicated to slavery. Where are the other national museums? And he had to tell him, we don't have any. Oh, there's some cities and some counties that have something. There's not a federal museum to slavery in this country. And he said this, the people from the other countries, they look at him like, because it makes no sense. It was so huge. And the repercussions are still there, but there isn't one. So that adds more importance to the legacy of the National Peace Memorial because it's all there is. And they decided to focus on the lynching, but across the street they have the Legacy Museum, which you know is, is more of a traditional museum. Last Friday, the day after Valentine's Day, the U.S. Senate passed a bill that will make lynching a federal crime. I think that bill was sponsored by uh, Senator Harris, and Senator Kamala Harris and, and Senator Cory Booker. I think those were the two individuals who sponsored the bill. The Senate passed it. Yay! But that doesn't make it law. What else has to happen? Who else has to vote? The House of Representatives, yeah. And it simply hasn't happened yet. It hasn't gone to them. I mean, the Senate just voted last week. So the House needs to vote. And then, of course, you know, laws, somebody has to sign them, right? <sighs> next slide, please. <laughs> and then the next slide. So the next two, yeah. So this is Plessy, this is 123 years since Plessy versus Ferguson. Okay, 154 years since the end of the Civil War. And we're finally 
almost getting a bill that will make lynching a federal crime, which means the states don't have to do it individually. You know, it's, it's just in this country that that's crime. As it is right now, it's not. You can't, you can't file federal charges. No. Okay. Um, why is this important? We just had a newspaper editor that called for the rise of the Klan again. Have you heard about that? Some of you are nodding, some of you are going, oh, yes. Says we think we need to have that again. Okay. There are people running around in blackface going, well, I think I didn't mean, you know, I thought it was cute, I look good, blah, 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 blah. All kinds of things. The thing that I would like for you, the younger ones of you, to understand is these symbols, um, if, if this were a program that was about Hispanic heritage, we could have a not too different and not much happier session about what our Latinx community has endured. Okay, it's just that this is Black History Month and so we're focusing on African Americans. The, the, the Japanese internment camps happened in the United States of America. What I would like for all of us to remember, and especially those of you for whom tomorrow is your future, you know, I'm, I'm dying, my generation's dying, it's not our future, it's your future. To remember that words really do have power, don't let anybody convince you that words don't matter, they do. And symbols and imagery, if you don't understand why a group is offended, don't, instead of taking the position of, well, I didn't mean anything by it, I just don't get it, ask the choice, get curious about, hmm, obviously there's something I don't know. Why is that offensive? That should be the question. The person might not be able to be the one to tell you, but become intellectually curious enough to try to find out. Why do they get all bent out of shape when I do this or when I say that? Why won't she let me touch her hair in the middle of Kroger, this woman that I never knew? Can I touch your hand? And just run, run to it with hands outstretched. Why do they say, why can't I wear a noose for a Halloween, Halloween uh, costume? I don't, I'm, what's wrong with that? These symbols, there's something behind them. There's a history that attaches to that. You know, Black Lives Matter is not just about young black men being killed in the street. It's about all of this. Black lives never mattered. They didn't matter with this either. And people don't know. They want to say, oh, it's a violent group. It's against police officers. No, it's against this. It's against the terror that seems sometimes to be non-stopping. Does that make sense? Okay. So it's important to, yesterday matters because it helps to inform us so that we can better move through today and for you to hopefully build a better tomorrow. We did our best, my generation, we meant well. We cleaned up a lot of mess that our parents left behind us, but we also made some messes along the way. I'm so sorry. We didn't, we didn't do it on purpose. Well, maybe a couple of things, but you know, generally, no. And so you've got a dustpan and a broom coming back behind us. So maybe you will fix this problem. I hope so. Thank you.